Thank you very much for being here. As Sharon mentioned, my name is Stephen Fagan. I'm the associate curator. Uh, we have a very active oral history project here at the museum where we go out and interview people about their memories of President Kennedy, certainly, but also the 1960s. We talk to folks who were involved in space and civil rights and the Peace Corps and the Vietnam War, capturing a tapestry of living history from that time period. And occasionally we do these programs that we call Living History, and we invite back a guest who has done an oral history in the past to come and share their story for an audience. And let me tell you, you're in for a real treat today because we're very honored to have Colonel Walt Cunningham with us. Uh, I want to give you a little background on him before we get started, and I'll give you an idea of how the format of this program is going to work. Uh, Walter Cunningham enlisted in the U.S. Navy right out of high school and spent six years as a military fighter pilot. Yet today he is best known as America's second civilian astronaut. He was a physicist at the RAND Corporation when he joined NASA in October of 1963 and was part of the historic Apollo 7 mission in 1968, the first manned flight of the Apollo program. And after Apollo, he was named Chief of the Skylab Astronauts. Since 1971, he's been in private business in Houston, Texas. The program today is going to be a conversation between Colonel Cunningham and myself, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions. And we do record these interviews, and they become a supplement to Colonel Cunningham's oral history in the museum's archives. So if you have a chance to ask a question today, you too will be part of the collection we're growing here at the Sixth Form Museum at Dealey Plaza. And so with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Colonel Walt Cunningham to the Sixth Floor Museum. <clears throat> we picked a great month to have you here because it was 50 years ago this month, May 5th, that uh, Alan Shepard made his historic flight as the first American in space. And, and, and that was a very important moment for you personally, wasn't it? Tell me about your memories of that day. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that... Uh... Part of that story is a little bit X-rated, but first I ought to, <laughs> ought to tell you, Stephen, that you could have just introduced me as an ancient astronaut. <laughs> yeah, you've met my wife. <clears throat> she tell you know she tells me I'm reminding her more and more of an old television set. You know what I mean? The instant on is off, the colors fading. It's taking longer to warm up, and vertical hole isn't what it used to be. <clears throat> I don't want too many of you to take that too sensitively out there. But that's an opportunity to introduce my wife, Dot, in the back. Yes, please stand up and be recognized. Maybe I can get out of trouble here. And my son, Brian, and his wife, Kathy. Thank you. <clears throat> but you asked me about Alan Shepard's flight. And uh, I didn't recognize it at the time. <clears throat> but later I came to realize that that was the moment that caused me to decide I was really going to become an astronaut. Because uh, at the time, <clears throat> I was flying with the Marine Corps Reserves. I'd gotten off of active duty because I had no college education, and I knew I couldn't go anyplace in the Marine Corps without college degree. <clears throat> I was back in the last year of a, uh, well, almost the last year of a doctorate in physics at the time. And I was that morning, I was driving over to where I was working at the RAND Corporation. And <clears throat> listening on the radio, it was a little before 7 o'clock, and I was listening to the countdown of uh, Alan Shepard's launch. It was a little bit before 10, down in Florida. And when I got down to the last couple of minutes, I couldn't drive anymore. I was up on Mulholland Drive, <clears throat> and in those days, they still had vacant spots along Mulholland. I pulled over and stopped, and I was listening to the final minutes and I got down to the count, and it was five, four, three, two, one, liftoff. And before that little redstone rocket had cleared the tower, I heard this voice screaming out, you lucky son of a bitch. And I looked around and realized it was me. I was doing the screaming. And up until that point, I had uh, <clears throat> envied the astronauts, but I don't think I had seriously thought beyond my uh, getting my doctorate in physics at the time. And from that moment on, I couldn't wait for the point when I could apply. And to make a long story short, I got selected after a long selection process. Just a couple years later, you were part of Group 3. Yeah. <clears throat> Two years after that, I was sharing an office with that same 
Alan B. Shepard. And it didn't take me long to realize that he was not a lucky SOB, he was a tough SOB. <laughs> the picture we have on the screen there is of the uh, group three of astronauts, and then the uh, back right there, the gentleman I'm circling, that's uh, Colonel Cunningham. Now, you were a physicist, and that sets you apart from the other guys in your group as a civilian. <coughs> Tell me um, what traits you brought with you to this, to this bold endeavor. I was officially, I was not on active duty, mm -hmm. And NASA at the point at that point was trying to, you know, the civilian space agency, but all the astronauts they had were active military fighter pilots. I was an active military fighter pilot, but I was in the reserves. Uh, in fact, the other civilian that came in in the, in the second group, they had two civilians, Elliot C., who was flying reserve, Navy reserve, same base I was, and Neil Armstrong, of course, but he was not in the reserves at the time. He was a NASA pilot. So they were looking for civilians, so I was designated a civilian astronaut. And uh, <clears throat> it, was, it was nice because I ended up being the second civilian to fly in space, <clears throat> but I was also the second Marine after John Glenn to fly in space. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but starting with, oh, the second group, uh, they started trying to expand what they were taking in as astronauts. And I always, always looked at the second group of astronauts, which was selected Oh, probably nine months before we were. And I've always thought that they somehow or other miscalculated and selected too few, and it's the reason they had another very early selection. But the second group of astronauts, they a lot of them had advanced degrees, they had good flying experience, and I've always felt that they were the more perfect match of everybody. When they came to our group, uh, we had about an average of an extra year beyond them, even as college education. but. I think of flying credentials, we opened it up to, you didn't have to be a test pilot to come in and a few of those kind of things. So NASA uh, was an evolving organization. Uh, <clears throat> can I tell a story about when I learned I was the 14th? It's your program, go right ahead. <laughs> it was uh, not very many years ago <clears throat> that uh, the public affairs guy at NASA at the time was a fellow by the name of Paul Haney. Paul Haney and I were friends, but over the years, uh, we never talked about this before. And when I wrote a book, well, the first, first edition of it was back in 1977. But sometime uh, after 2000, when I redid the book, Paul went back and he read the book. And he sent me an email. And uh, in that email, he pointed out, he says, well, when your book came out, all I did was check to see where my name was in it. You know, it looked looked in the index, and I didn't really read anything else, and he was very impressed with the book, and he, and he told me what he thought about the book, and then there was a line at the bottom. He says, you, you know you were the 14th out of the group of 14, don't you? And so I got very curious. I always thought I was one of the best. I really was. <laughs> So I, I asked Paul to get the story, and it really was interesting. <clears throat> he said that about a couple days, we were, we were uh, announced on the 14th of October, 1963. And the week before that, Deke Slayton, who was the head of all of the astronauts at the time, <clears throat> Deke had a meeting with the, uh, uh, all the directors and subdirectors of the Johnson Space Center. And in it, Deke was supposed to brief them on who the new astronauts were going to be before they were publicly announced. And uh, as he got into it, he, was, he would say a few things about each one and hand out their, their bios. <clears throat> and he got through with them all. And Paul Haney was supposed to be in that meeting, but he was on the phone someplace. And he didn't get there until uh, Deke had just finished making the, the announcements. And uh, when he finished, uh, oh, head of engineering at the time, I forget his name, who, who was a very technical guy. And the last guy in the world I would ever have believed would say this, he held up his hand and he says, Deke, he said, this is when Paul comes in, says, Deke, you can't do that. That's 13. You either have to take 12 or, or 14. I mean, I, I, I would never believed him, him saying this, who, who he happened to be. And Deke uh, says, whoever it was, was number 13, he says, well, I really want to have so-and-so here. 
But if I have to take 14, here's the 14th, and he laid out my bio. <laughs> so I always figured I was fortunate I got in just under the edge there. <laughs> Now this was October of 1963, and, and of course President Kennedy was in office at that time, a month before the assassination here in Dallas. Kennedy will be forever connected to the space program and the popular imagination. Uh, we have up here his um, uh, quote to Congress, his famous quote of putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade, which uh, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of that statement a couple days ago. What did Kennedy's leadership and these words mean to you at that time? Well, I think I should point out that before this address to Congress, I think was when he was talking at Rice University, wasn't he? Actually, that was a little bit later, but I have that yeah. quote here as yeah. well. Okay. 62. <clears throat> well, first, let me ask, how many of you in the audience here have already been through the museum? Can I see your hands, please? Okay. Uh, I was just fortunate uh, to go through this museum for the first time. <clears throat> and I, I found it would be... Uh, exceptional when it comes to history, its objectivity and what it presented. And most of it is on, of course, the death of President Kennedy. And I can remember that vividly. I was in still at UCLA at the time. I'd been selected and I was going to be coming down here. Uh, actually, about six weeks later, I was moving to Houston, Texas. But what I get out of this museum is a little bit something different. I don't focus on what I've seen in this museum on the death and the controversies and all those kind of things. What I see at the beginning of this is what we really ought to be carrying away and that is the example, almost perfect example of the kind of leadership it takes you know, to be president of the country. Uh, there's a lot of things that I didn't necessarily agree with President Kennedy on but it makes no difference. It takes somebody willing to make the hard decisions, to make the decisions about things that are not certainty, uh, to do it in spite of what it might mean in an election campaign or what have you. So what I got out of this more than anything else was once more a refreshing reminder of what it takes uh, to be president. And what happened was in 1959, the Russians, uh, was 50, yeah, 57 or 59, they launched Sputnik. Uh, and of course, the Sputnik, uh, it amazed us. Because up until that time, uh, as Americans, we always thought we were, uh, exceptional. We couldn't be matched in the world of technology. And all of a sudden we found out that, hey, we must be slipping. Because look at this, the Russians are up there ahead of us. Uh, a couple years later, four years later, we have Yuri Gagarin going up for the first orbit of the Earth. And it was only <clears throat> just a short time after that, uh, that well, three weeks later we had uh, Alan Shepard go to a suborbital mission. But three weeks after that, President Kennedy stood up and challenged us to go to the moon. That was done for a variety of reasons. And I'm sure that if it was not for having the space race, which President Kennedy initiated, his speech to land a man on the moon and return safely in this decade <clears throat> so it was to put the United States back in the leadership position that we'd enjoyed at least for the last 50, 60, maybe 100 years and to uh, reassume the position that he felt that we belonged in. Leaders in the world to the degree that we could be. And so I look at that statement as the real, the real challenge. And it was, it was willing to tackle the impossible. In order to do things like this, you have to have not only the technology and the money, you have to have the willingness to do it. And that's one of the things that seems to be slipping in our society. You have to be willing to take these challenges. So I look at, at the 60s and President Kennedy's role, we would be nowhere as near where we are in space today, even though it's slipping, if we're not for somebody willing to make that challenge in the first place. Did, did these words of President Kennedy's take on a new significance for NASA and for you personally after his death? Uh, no, and I'm kind of 
I, I can speak more for like the astronauts of my generation <clears throat> than anything. I think most of us all thought that way. I mean, the attitude of the people that I was with in the astronaut office in the 1960s, we never ever knew there were any doubts. I mean, we were there to do it. We knew it was all the case. You paid the price. Uh, the price wasn't just in dollars. As a matter of fact, we knew that the that the price was going to be in terms of lives. That it was there was nothing going to be cheap about it. And I'll inject right now, space is never going to be cheap and expensive. Uh, just this week, the Kennedy Libraries released some tapes, some private conversations mm -hmm. where Kennedy expresses doubt that man really can reach the moon by 1970. Um, with the perspective we have now in 2011, how actively involved would you say he was in, in the 60s, getting the space program moving and in the day-to-day -day operations of NASA? Well, <clears throat> I would characterize NASA in those days as just another government agency, of which he had many. Uh, of course, what they were doing was more exciting and I don't think that President Kennedy was involved in any kind of detail in any of it, except emotionally. I think he was emotionally committed to these things. <clears throat> and his reservations, who wouldn't have reservations you know, in the population at large? You can't realize and put in perspective the difference between then and now. What are we talking about going to Mars? I will ignore this business of going back to the moon after 40 years. But we're talking about going to Mars. There's nobody out there hardly that thinks that that's impossible. They might think we don't do it, or it might be too expensive, but you don't reject it. I have to tell you this, in 1963, going to the moon was considered impossible by most of the public. If somebody had told me when I was sitting in a high school auditorium and listening to some speaker that I should work hard because it could get me to the moon someday, I mean, who would even pay attention? It was impossible. Now you can talk to young people today, <clears throat> and even though they don't get as excited about it, you can talk about going to Mars, and believe me, it is much more believable than going to the moon was then. <clears throat> so most people had some kind of reservations. And when I say we didn't have any doubts, we thought we were going to do it. But, you know, management, uh, they, uh, they knew it was going to be a very, very difficult task. And they lived in the job every bit as much as we did. We had the glory. We were out front. The public was always going around making a big foo-foo over the astronauts. But believe me, if it wasn't for the operational expertise we had at that time and the management, and more importantly, management's willingness to make decisions instead of being tied up in a bureaucracy, we would never have made it when we did. And as I look back on it now and realize how fortunate I was to live in that period, I too am tremendously impressed that, you know, eight and a half years after that speech, we were walking on the moon. And that included a 19-month hiatus after the Apollo 1 fire <clears throat> before we flew on the first mission on Apollo 7. So it was a hell of an accomplishment. The Kennedy assassination is a cultural touchstone. And, and here at the museum, we recognize that there are moments in all of our lives when uh, a national tragedy brings us together collectively. I know for people of my generation, the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986 was, in many ways, our Kennedy assassination. Uh, as an Apollo astronaut, I'd be interested in your perspective on that um, 1986 disaster. Well, I, I wasn't watching the launch. <clears throat> that was like our 25th shuttle launch. Uh, learned about it later and saw the replays. <clears throat> I. It's hard to put it in, into words because I was not as terribly shocked as probably the public at large. <clears throat> and I was not uh, as terribly surprised because I knew we have to expect losses and I knew how much safer the shuttle was than the Apollo spacecraft was during its heyday. 
But as the accident investigation carried on, to me, as I went through and analyzed those things, and I still read and write a, a lot about some of these things, I saw it as an example of the deterioration in the NASA structure and the management abilities that was the major factor. There was no, uh, the spacecraft except the shuttle, of course, had no failure. It was the booster. It wasn't something that couldn't have been predicted, but I will tell you this, in my firm opinion, the management that we had back in the 60s with the Bob Gurus, the Chris Crafts, those people, the Challenger with that problem in the boosters that they'd seen signs of before probably would not have been flying. When they saw it, they would have fixed it, and they would have grounded it until they fixed it. Uh, and the same thing when you get the Columbia disaster. Uh, both those accidents, in my opinion, were to a great degree preventable by management activities and management decisions. Uh, but NASA itself, it's a reflection of the changes in our society that have gone on since then, <clears throat> and they were not as capable. There's no question in my mind that the golden age of manned spaceflight was the back of the 1960s and early 70s. You were part of the backup crew for Apollo 1 when the fire took place in 1967. That deeply affected NASA's morale and the, and the public's perception of, of the dangers of space exploration. Um, what did that fire do to your job, and, and how did that make the eventual flight of Apollo 7 all the more significant? Well, there's a couple of questions there. The, um, we had been backup crew for about, I think, three and a half, four months at the time. They'd canceled. We were originally the crew of Apollo 2. It was a mission that was more or less redundant to Apollo 1 because <laughs> in those days, believe me, you couldn't count on the success of each mission. It was still very early. So if Apollo 1 had not accomplished all the things it was supposed to do, we were going to fly Apollo 2, and we had a few extra things added on, but we were going to go back and accomplish those things that Apollo 1 couldn't. Well, as we got behind schedule, and of course we had to land on the moon before the end of the decade, they canceled Apollo 2, which is a big disappointment to us. Next day we were assigned as backup crew on Apollo 1 because we were flying the same kind of identical spacecraft. And the backup, the original backup crew on Apollo 1 went on to fly Apollo 9. But, so we were working with the crew. I found I had a, I developed a, a whole new level of respect for Gus Grissom, who was the commander of Apollo 1. The night before the fire, we had performed the same test, but we had not had what they call plugs out. We plugs out, you disconnect from all external power and you close the hatch. And it was much more realistic to a real flight, but we've done all the same uh, tests. We, 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 we still had external power on. And we'd waited all day long for those guys to finish this relatively simple test if you just didn't have problems. And finally it got late in the afternoon, and uh, it was a, I think it was a Friday afternoon, and we were always, at that point, we were trying to go home for the weekend. Put this in perspective, let me tell you that we did not expect Apollo 1 to fly in a month. They were scheduled to fly the next month. Mm -hmm. We knew that there were too many things wrong with that spacecraft. We'd been aware of them, uh, and we knew that it took a while to fix a lot of these. But I have always looked at the astronauts, us as a matter of fact, the astronaut office, as kind of... Uh, we had a liability to play in that fire as well, because along the engineering and the development project, you'd have to know the people and know the kind of confidence we had. Maybe you might call it egos. But we would rationalize on some of the things that we knew were not quite up to snuff, and we thought that we could compensate for them. We thought we were so good that we could fix, well, that might go wrong, okay, I can handle it, and we knew how we were going to handle it. We had not anticipated this problem with 100% oxygen. And it, our immediate reaction afterwards 
was, you know, holy cow, why didn't we know better? I mean, I'm talking about us as individuals, because we'd lived with oxygen all our life in, in flying jet fighters. And for us to not realize the kind of accident you could have when you had fully saturated, that crew had been totally enclosed, everything in the spacecraft was saturated with 100% oxygen, all it takes is a spark, and all it took was 19 seconds, and they were gone. <clears throat> so we were on an airplane flying back. We were flying home for the weekend. When we landed, crew was dead. Difficult to believe, but our, our main concern was about the program. We expected losses. The Air Force used to have a, a, a theme. My brother was an Air Force fighter pilot, and he was of the era where the theme in the, the Air Force uh, was you got, for fighter pilots, you got to expect losses. And so that was kind of a natural part of our life. <clears throat> we were concerned that the reaction would cause either legislators or the public at large to want to cancel the program. We always expected to pay a price. We also looked at it as a, uh, a significant contributor to the success of the Apollo program because uh, we knew we could have lost a spacecraft in orbit someplace, in which case it wouldn't come back. We had no automatic way of re-entering it. You wouldn't be able to find out what was wrong, maybe. And so here we had this accident take place on the ground, totally unexpected, never could figure out exactly what caused it. But we had all of this in front of us. We stopped and fixed anything that could cause it. And because that took time, we were able to fix a lot of things that we wanted as a flight crew, things that we used operationally that we hadn't been able to get in before because the uh, uh, the schedule delays. Everything was emphasizing schedule in those days. The least important of, you know, there was schedule, weight, and cost. So cost was the lowest of the three priorities on that. And so all of a sudden we were able to have the delay in the schedule, willing to pay the price, and we got a much better spacecraft. I can tell you this, Apollo 7, it was the longest, uh, most ambitious, and most successful first test flight of any new machine ever. And I guarantee you it would not have been that way had we not had the loss of uh, Apollo 1. But there was a lot riding on that mission because if Apollo 7 failed, <laughs> very likely you would not have reached the moon by 1970. And in fact, that's the only real pressure we felt. Uh, and I'm just talking about the crew there. I don't know <clears throat> what the feelings were of everybody else. We didn't talk about things like that. It was not a philosophical topic. But among the crew, we were well aware uh, that uh, if this mission fails, it's not going to fail because of me. I mean, that was the way everybody felt in those days. And our concern was that if we fail on Apollo 7, then there's really going to be pressure to cancel the program to go to the moon. There was another very critical aspect of it that people don't realize. And I can talk about some of the, you've heard me say that I thought management was one of the real key factors we had in those days. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. And this is a good example right here. The first one, for example, the commitment to go to the moon on the Apollo program was made before we had the first American in orbit. It was before John Glenn's flight. And we were going to d develop a rocket and uh, launchers that would take us to the moon. Well, it didn't take too long working it into that program, the Apollo program, to realize <coughs> that we're going to have a couple of years here with no flights after the Mercury is over. So almost just like that, they dreamed up and invented the Gemini program. Can you imagine that today? And so they worked up the Gemini program. Uh, it flew for two years. We flew uh, 10 missions. We performed all of the essential activities that were necessary to go to the moon. That was rendezvous, EVA and controlled re-entry. And all of that was worked in, you know, between the two programs. 
The next thing that, we, that I think of as an example is the way management was able to make a decision and make it stick was there was never, in the Apollo program, we had planned missions for years. We sit in our briefings and we had, you know, mission A, B, C, D, what have you. It might have changed a little bit over time, but there was never an Apollo 8 mission, meaning there was never a mission to go out and just fly around the moon. Uh, and what happened once more in the schedule, late in our training, uh, we were beginning to realize that the lunar module, the lunar excursion module, the one you had to land on the moon, was uh, running behind schedule. Difficult problem, really. Uh, you look back on it. And it, because it was going to run behind schedule, the mission to follow us wasn't going to have a lunar module uh, in time. So they decided tentatively uh, about a month before we flew, they made a decision that what we'll do is we're gonna, we'll slip the first lunar module to the third flight. And we'll, we'll take a, uh, the vehicle without a lunar module and we will go around the moon with it, Apollo 8. They dreamed it up, subject to only one thing. The decision was made subject to the success of our flight. And if our flight had no really significant problems, then they would stick with that commitment to fly Apollo 8 around the moon. And the real obstacle in those days, and what I look at it, is, is this was a real challenge to the ground, to mission control and people like that, because they had to face the psychological barrier. They had to overcome this barrier of turning loose from the Earth's gravitational field. I think I can re I reflect the opinion of the other astronauts at the time. We didn't think of it that way. I mean, we were going to fly that spacecraft wherever it had to go. So it was not a big psychological barrier in the sense that it was to the ground, because the ground is committing other people's lives to going out of this gravitational field, and they're going to have to then, you know, make a burn around the moon and get back to Earth uh, and then they're going to have to make the right kind of reentry. Not a simple thing, believe me. <clears throat> and so it was a big obstacle in their thinking. And they were able, able to overcome it, able to make it stick, and on a very short time. So I don't remember what question I was starting with. <laughs> That's, <to answer>. okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's we're, okay. We're very lucky here in Dallas to actually have the Apollo 7 command module. It's on display at the Frontiers of Flight Museum at Love Field. And we owe Mrs. Cunningham a great deal of uh, gratitude and thanks for securing that and making sure it's at the museum here in Dallas. Are any of our friends from the Frontiers of Flight Museum here today? Oh, excellent. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, with, with the Vietnam War and civil rights, the deaths of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy, it's been suggested that the space program, specifically the success of Apollo 7 and Apollo 8, ultimately saved 1968. How do you feel about that? Well, if you are depressed by all the other things that were happening, uh, certainly it was not my life, uh, you know, the, the 60s era. In fact, a lot of that was happening. It passed by us almost. We were so dedicated and so committed that we didn't have a chance to experience that the way others did. But there is no question, in my opinion, that the flights, the beginning of the Apollo program there, in 1968, it saved uh, the 60s. I mean, you can't go back and just be down on the 60s now because uh, what that did is it set the stage for, well, a period of what? The last landing was what, 72, 68 to 72. You cannot imagine the benefits that came out of the Apollo program. The Apollo program was an investment in our future. And those spin-offs, if you will, and various other improvements that came out of tackling the impossible, uh, they drove the economic engine that kept us going for the next 30 years, I think. It drove the economic en engine. It was the first time in history that that was done with something that was not a war. Wars always 
drive the economy as well, because you have to have new developments. You have to think out of, the, out of the box and do these things. Well, with the space program, we did that without going to war to do it. And so I think it was a tremendous uh, investment. And the American public back in those days was more oriented towards what we can do to improve our society as opposed to what we seem to be more oriented to today is surviving and uh, you know, benefiting. And it, I don't see that same drive going on today. And that's one of the reasons why they have a very tough time you know, moving into a serious effort to go to Mars or anyplace else. Let's, let's talk about that for a moment. The private sector increasingly is being pinpointed as the future of the space mm -hmm. program. Um, is that something you agree with? Well, I ran my own venture capital fund, investing in early stage startup companies for about 12 years. And I know what a commercial venture is. You see an opportunity, you make an investment of time, money, effort, thinking, and you're doing that on the basis that you're going to get a, a payback. Those people that put the money in are looking for a return from it. A commercial venture has an uh, asset growth and you make a profit. The so-called commercial space companies of today, <clears throat> they are not much different, I don't, very, diff very little difference as a matter of fact, from those that we've always used to do our, I think that must be his problem, uh, for what we've always done to go into space. You know, the North Americans, North American Rockwells, the Grumman's, the Boeing's, those are all commercial companies. And they do make money off the government contracts. Without the government contracts, I guarantee you they would not be building spacecraft. And the same thing is happening today where we have new generation, I think people that are not thoroughly familiar with the history, they think they're starting a whole new uh, business. If they weren't subsidized by government contracts right today, then they wouldn't be even have any kind of hope out there to ever, you, may, you find me reluctant to talk about making a profit. I was a venture capitalist for a long time. Uh, I'm interested in a lot of things in life and I've taken a look at it. I do not find anything that I think is a commercially viable aspect of space yet. Will it be there someday? I think maybe there will be. But you have to be able to do it and make a profit for it to be commercially viable. Unless that happens, it's going to have to be supported. I'm also a small government person that doesn't like to see the government doing all these things. However, when it comes to space and space exploration, I think only national governments are going to be able to do that for you know, not only my lifetime, but my, my kids' lifetime, and I don't know when. There may eventually come a time to be commercially viable, but these companies, uh, they're doing their best, and they're going to save some money in some respects. And so far, what they're doing is they're riding on the coattails of what NASA has developed already. They're not as bureaucratic like government agencies become. I uh, can't believe the bureaucracy in NASA today compared to what it was in the 1960s. And they're going to be uh, able to make decisions a little bit quicker. And they've got all of 50 years of development in space to build on. So I think that they can be more efficient. Because I think private commercial enterprises are more efficient than government enterprises. The Apollo program inspired an entire generation of baby boomers. Some of them are here in the audience today. I personally don't see that inspiration among today's youth with our space program. And I'm curious on your thoughts about how the youth of this country can get more inspired and more interested in the exploration of space. Good question. I agree with you. I don't see it either. Uh, I've been speaking to schools and audiences like that uh, for years until I found ways of getting out of it. But I still do it once in a while. And in the old days, I tell you, almost everyone in the audience 
wanted to be in the space program. Many of them wanted to be astronauts, or they wanted to work there. It was, it was the most challenging, most desirable place in the world to work. Today, if I talk to a young people's audience, I talked to a high school audience uh, a couple months ago, and I asked, uh, it was probably about this many people, I says, how many here have heard of or know anything about the Apollo program? Not one hand. And I've been told that in the history books, and they don't teach history that much anymore, but in the history books, uh, there might be one page devoted to Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, something like that. So it's missing. It's not their fault. That is our fault. We're the ones that have become, begun to accept things like that. The inspiration in the old days was because we were doing something that hadn't been done before. But they were also inspired, like, you know, to become pilots, aviators. I don't remember growing up and ever wanting to be a fireman or a policeman or anything like that, but I, always, I'm, I remember I wanted to be lieutenant commander in the Navy Air Corps. And I'm sure it's because one of those wartime movies had a lieutenant commander in it that, was, that inspired me to want to do that. But I don't remember any, ever wanting to be anything else, and I never thought that there was any possibility that I couldn't be. So going into space for my generation, from the military pilot's perspective, it was just the next step up the ladder, higher, farther, faster, and the like. Today, we have, I think, worked overtime to remove the obstacles from young people to where they just have built in inspiration for themselves, to do what they can for themselves. They look to others to take care of these things. And that's our fault. And I'm not sure it can be reversed anymore. But when I talk to young people today, I don't see those that are in inspired to do this. Okay, what's the other side of that coin? NASA, which is the, out at the boundaries of, of our universe now, NASA has the obligation to do that inspiration. Not an, obs obs uh, excuse me, <clears throat> an obligation to uh, fly teachers in space or an obligation to hand out uh, scholarships for science education. I mean, there's a lot of agencies doing that. So NASA has uh, just kind of uh, distributed their interest anymore. They're no longer focusing on just being the inspiration. If there was a serious program today uh, for NASA to operate in space, and before we do get through, I do want to talk about a little bit about that. But the, if NASA had a serious program today to do something like go to Mars, or I will accept even go out and you know, land on a meteoroid or something, although that's something that was added in order to uh, appease those who want to go to Mars. And they said, well, we'll do this. It's difficult. If NASA was doing that, young people would be inspired. Some of them at least. And I bet most of you know somebody or have your own children or grandchildren out there that, that would do that. But until we provide them that kind of uh, opportunity to look up to something like that, it's going to be really tough. I want to take a few questions from the audience and then we'll let you make any final comments you want to make. I'm putting up here a, a picture of Colonel Cunningham's book, The All-American Boys, and also his website, so you can learn more information about his life and career at his website and also by picking up a copy of his book. I think because of my background, <clears throat> Deke had already ticketed me to take over the uh, Skylab branch of the astronaut office, because that was going to be our first space station, and it was going to be doing a lot of science. <clears throat> And while I avoided it like the plague, they thought of me, I think, as a scientist. 
And I spent my whole time trying to demonstrate I was the best fighter pilot they had, not a damn scientist. <clears throat> but if there had been any doubt, during our mission, there was a defugality between, essentially it was between Wally Shira on the ground, and I think that reflected on, on all of us. And so I think there was a, re I'm not sure what would have happened had he not had that fight. But to give you a little bit of the insight in uh, space flight and training and crews, there was something, well, all of this stuff is covered in good detail in my, in my book. I am, incidentally, the first edition of my book came out in 1977. I used to feel a little bit embarrassed to push it because it was not, my opinion wasn't that important. But over the years, I've gotten to the point where I am not reluctant to recommend it. It's generally considered one of the top one or two books written about the space program. And a lot of these things that you might be interested in, I answer then. But we had something called the pecking order. Everybody, we all had a military rank. <clears throat> uh, even me as a civilian, I was a captain when I went into the NASA. When I left NASA eight years later, I was a colonel in the Marine Corps. And so we all had a military rank, but that wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing that we had, and incidentally, it wasn't uh, so important uh, you know, what your job was necessarily either. It was when you were selected. The, the Mercury astronauts saw to it that there was never, ever an opportunity, as long as they could control it, for a Gemini or an Apollo astronauts. We were considered the Apollo astronauts uh, to usurp them in any way. Uh, so they, there was just pecking order that determined what happened. Now, what else did you have going for you? Incidentally, I was so naive and stupid in those days, I hadn't figured all of this out. The pecking order, yes. But it also turned out that as you moved into a flight, by the time we got there, of course, you didn't start off commanding a mission. You went in as a, a, a pilot or lunar module pilot or something like that. But the commanders, you lived very, very close. I lived just like that with Wally Shira for three years and Don Isley. And the commanders took care of their guys afterwards. I mean, kind of it, uh, it rubbed off on their ranking. Uh, you know, like Tom Stafford, after Gene Cernan flew with him, and Tom Stafford ended up being head of the astronaut office, what Tom Stafford had to say about Gene Cernan's career, control it, really. Well, when we flew on Apollo 7, Wally had already told him he was leaving the space program afterwards. Wally wasn't concerned about his future, and he didn't hang around uh, to look out for his guys, if you will. So we were, we were all pretty much on our own. So, but you asked, what was it, how did it change your attitude and your outlook? People there are usually they're concerned, as did it change you spiritually in some way or something like that, and I can tell you, that almost all of them uh, are like me. No, it did not. Uh, we probably didn't even have much chance to think about it. We, we were so oriented and focused on doing our job that we didn't even stop and think about that. There were a few people that did, and there are a few people who say that uh, it had a spiritual impact on them. But most of us thought of it as accomplishment, a technical accomplishment. And we were all so proud to do that for our country. Among everything else is we felt like that was the biggest payoff. And as I look back on it now, uh, you know, nobody today, if they're writing about the Apollo program, they don't even talk about Apollo 7. Or Apollo 9 rarely gets mentioned because it was Earth orbit 2. All the rest of them went out to the moon. Uh, but I see myself as maybe being a little footnote on probably the most important event uh, that took place in the 20th century. Uh, so I, I've got some, a lot of pride in that, but I don't oversell it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> well, I can't make that claim. I can claim I was it was my sketch that decided what we were going to use as a, uh, uh, a particular uh, emblem for Apollo 7. And 
uh, the Apollo 1 crew, uh, they had uh, ordered some medallions, <clears throat> and they were dealing with somebody on the West Coast, and because I had a relationship with the Robbins people, that just seemed like the logical place for us to make those medallions. But <clears throat> it was no big competition or anything. We were looking for the best price. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because those, those medallions, a few medallions, some medallions went and flew on many of these missions. Sometimes few, sometimes a lot. Apollo 7 was not representative. We, everything we did on Apollo 7 was oriented towards that mission. There was all the uncertainties of the systems and all of those things. To give you a perfect example of how little we carried on there as personal gear or uh, souvenirs we had from the spacecraft, because now you see it if you go to auctions, you find people that have uh, hand controllers they brought back from the moon, and I, they must have torn their spacecraft apart and got a lot of parts out of it. I see all those kind of things. Those were all later Apollo missions. On our mission, uh, which was Earth orbital, and we were going to have an opportunity occasionally to see the Earth and take some pictures, we only carried 440 frames of film for our uh, Hasselblad camera because every camera back that we put on there uh, meant that we had to leave off some reaction control system fuel. Well, we'd never flown and tested that reaction control system fuel and we, know, we thought we knew how much fuel it was going to use but we didn't know and if in fact the engine, which had never been tested in space, wasn't working we had to have a backup way of deorbiting, and we had developed one where we could use the reaction control system. If they didn't wear out while we were doing it, we could deorbit with the RCS system. So it was just natural that we made all these compromises yeah. to fly. So we didn't have all that. Later missions, they had sometimes they flew a lot of medallions. Medallions weigh a lot, uh, and they brought back all these other kind of parts. So it kind of depends on where you were in that Apollo program. We were shocked, Don Isley and I, and Wally, we would see what some of these other people brought back for the mission. Today I have, other than a few personal items that we flew, I have only one souvenir from uh, the Apollo 7 spacecraft. And that we didn't know about that at the time. It's because North American Rockwell, <coughs> the contractor that built it, and we had lived out there with them for two years, building and testing a spacecraft. They flew three uh, nameplates on the spacecraft that we didn't know about. Uh, you know, just like a part on the back of your iPhone today, you'll find a little thing. They flew three of these, and when we got back, they uh, gold-plated them and presented us with a desktop pen and pencil set. That's the only piece I've got from the spacecraft. I'm pretty candid with my thoughts about it. I may not always be right, but I'm always pretty positive. Uh, and it brought it home to me again today when I went through this museum and looked at all the decisions of which one was the space program for uh, uh, President Kennedy. And as I've watched the presidents since that time, Money has been going downhill for NASA since, well, Nixon, Richard Nixon, started cutting back. They, they canceled the last three Apollo missions, and, and nobody has been willing to spend the money. And money has gone from an investment in our future, which is what the space program really is, from an investment in our future to, like I say, sustaining and maintaining and uh, instead of reaching out and looking for leadership and trying to be preemptive in whatever you were doing. So we've reached the point today where you had asked me about the commercial companies. Well, those commercial companies, they're almost the only iron in the fire on some things for NASA now, and they're not going to pay off like those commercial companies think they're going to. But will they succeed? Probably eventually, because 
they'll keep pumping whatever money they need to to put in to do it. But we're not doing anything with it. We're not exploring with it. There's no rationale or justification why any commercial startup company is want to go out and explore outer space. And they like to say that, well, they're going to reduce the uh, cost to the point where people will be taking trips into space. There will always be a few events, you know, a few people with hundreds of millions of dollars who are willing to do something like that as long as there's somebody around willing to take them. Will it ever pay off? Absolutely not. I'm familiar with the studies. I'm familiar with the, uh, the market studies looking at it. The prices they're talking about paying. They like to talk about it and draw the analogy between the space program and commercial aviation. There's nothing like it. There's no market like there was when the commercial aviation came into, into its own in the 1930s. Everybody wanted to get someplace faster, communications faster, what have you. There is no place to go in space unless it's developed by an agency that's funded by, in our case, the US government. It's just not going to pay off. It's always going to be very expensive. It's not going to be cheap. Uh, you're not going to have magic engines to do these things. And the public at large, it's always going to be a stunt. I I'll add one other thing, and then I will quit here, too because I have been very, very troubled by what I see now. There's been, I think there's been 10 passengers in space. There's a lot of passengers on the shuttle. The guys up front are the same guys that we used to be. They're all military trained, very, very capable aviators. There's a lot of people riding in the back. They'll never have the same attitude and the same outlook. They'll always be betting on those guys in the front seat, just like you do when you get on a commercial airliner. But we now have 10 people that have paid 20 to $40 million for a trip into space, which makes me realize what a good deal I got. <laughs> <laughs> but to have some of them and many of them running around and, and using the title astronaut is an insult. It's a total insult. Being an astronaut was not just making that trip. That was, a, that was like a vacation for me compared to what being an astronaut required up to that time. And of course, now we've got, uh, well, who's the guy that's taking passengers up in the spaceship too? Yeah, Branson. Branson. And uh, I've communicated with them, and some of the others have communicated with them, because they use the title of becoming an astronaut too. Spend a couple of days learning how to wear the suit and what have you, and you go up and back. And they're advertising them as astronauts. I'm sorry, that's just a pet peeve of mine these days. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed the museum. Thank you.